All right. We're here today with Jamie Newberry of Picture This Clothing. How are you doing today, Jamie? I'm doing great today, Garrett. How are you? I'm fantastic. Uh, can you start off, give us a little bit of background. Um, tell us about Picture This Clothing and your history and kind of how you got where you are today. Oh, boy. A long story. <laughs> I'll give you a, the really quick um, picture. This is it's the opportunity to wear your imagination. Very simply, you print a coloring sheet kid designs it any way they want. We do adults too, but um, design it any way you want and we make it real. I'm wearing an example today, um, but yeah, it, it's just this magical experience. It's not just a shirt or a, a dress, but anyway, um, how we got there is uh, quite a, I think an amazing story. Um, you know, there's like the short version that we share online with everyone, but I think sometimes when, um, you know, the, the story gets shared, a lot gets lost a lot of the history gets lost. And I think that there's so much important stuff in what happened before, because I think when people see picture this clothing, they learn the story. Oh, they went viral. We went, we went viral on the day we launched, which is kind of a weird thing, but I'll get there. There was so much that happened before that. And there's so many that, you know, it's not just like instant success. Um, and I, I think just to get started, like if you go back way back, to around 2012, 2011, 2010, um, in those years. Um, so my partner in this company, um, I have a couple partners, but my co-founder, Ken Finney, um, and I, we've been, we're partners in business, partners in life. And um, we, he was having a, his own set of challenges back in that time window with physical stuff, um, just joints, his joints stopped moving. He, he was in a wheelchair for a while, he couldn't walk. And we didn't know why we were going to doctors trying to get diagnoses and nobody could give him an answer. And it just like it just seemed to be getting worse and worse and worse um, in around the same time period. Uh, I lost my dad and in 2012 and I was you know working in a job that I, I really quite liked. But it caused me to just disconnect with the work. And I had a background as a designer. And um, when you can't connect with your work as a designer, you probably shouldn't be doing it anymore. Um, design is an emotional and engaging thing. And that was what my work was all about, was um, helping companies create engaging and emotional experiences, not just products. And um, when I felt that disconnect in my own life, I couldn't, I felt like I could, just couldn't do it anymore. And um, so just like over the course of about eight months, I just burned out. I just hit this crazy burnout. And um, so I ended up leaving my job. And, you know, so my partner was working on his own stuff. And I'll let him tell his story another day, but through all the physical stuff. And meanwhile, I was really just trying to figure out um, not, not so much what's next for me. I did. That was an important question. But what's important to me was where I placed all my energy. It was, you know, not what's next, it's what's important. And when I really put my focus into that, it was all about my family and it was all about, yes, I want to be able to support my family and stuff, but um, take my earrings out, they're clanking <laughs> against the thing. Um, but it was all about really trying to figure out, you know, how do I prioritize what's important to me and make all of those decisions um, all the decisions that affect everything I do every day as a career, as a, a as a mom, as a girlfriend, um, and, and align these things toward what's important. And once I started doing that, and I don't want to oversimplify it, I started basically designing my life as a product designer. I was like, what if I design my life the way that I design products? I think I can use the same process. And it turns out you can. And I just started using that process. And, and you know, anything I would do to a product, working with a client to help them build something, I pointed that at myself and said, you know, like, what are my values? And, you know, if it's a product, it's design principles. And, you know, for life, it's like core values. And, and once I started doing that, these things just started happening. And I ended up um, sharing my story through burnout and back again. Um, and, you know, I got invited to speak all over the world, sharing the story through Burnout and Back Again. And then it kind of evolved. It, it evolved into something called No Excuses. And I started telling that story out in the public circuit. And, um, and it was kind of like a chapter two. And if you're at all into digital products or technology, um, you know, the first was kind of like get your your minimum viable product out. So that mm -hmm. was like my through Burnout and Back Again. And then it's like iteration and features, right? Mm -hmm. And so... 
my no excuses was kind of like how I became, I started practicing, um, like iterating through what was working, what wasn't working in my own life. And what unfolded is I, I became a coach instead of a designer. I was coaching people who were going through burnout, um, how to work through it and how to overcome it and come out on the other side. And whether that's a career change or whatever, different for everyone. And then that sort of parlayed into going back to my roots as a designer, but in a different role where I was now advising companies, I would come in and help companies with their teams, team engagement, and parlaying that into like, I, I believe that human beings are the connective tissue between products and human beings. So, um, your products are the connective tissue between humans. You got humans on both sides. Yeah. So I really, um, I made that my my life's work. And one of my what's importance was to build more space in my life. And that just meant I want to have more time to spend with my family. Um, I want to do work that I love, don't we all? We can't always do everything we love all the time. I realize that. But I started shaping things and I was doing stuff that I loved. I was helping people work through problems, create more engaging um, products, uh, emotionally engaging products in a new way that I hadn't done before as just a designer. Um, not that there's anything wrong with being just a designer. Um, you know, and so I was helping people and and that really meant a lot to me. Um, and I was helping them through the experiences that I had gone through. And because I'd created more space in my life, I created this like opportunity. I was hanging out with my kids, you know, um, and my daughter, one Christmas break, she's home from school as kids are on Christmas break. And um, she draws this picture of a dress. She brings it to me. She's um, six, almost seven, just about to turn seven at the time. And um, she she brings this drawing and I look at it and I say, oh my gosh, I can make this. Like I'm working from home. I've got a little bit of time. I can you know do this. I can arrange my time the way that I want to because I work from home. And I was like, I could, I could make this dress. I've just enough sewing skills to make this happen. <laughs> and so we went to the fabric store, spent about a hundred bucks, um, which is a lot, uh, about a hundred bucks on supplies and materials to make this dress happen. And about 12 hours over the next three days, I was able to kind of cobble this little dress together. I put it on her when it was all done. And she says, I'm wearing my imagination, which was this magical moment in parenthood, right? So um, she wears it. She wears it for the next three months. Like I, like I have to peel it off her <laughs> you know, to wash it. And everywhere we go, people, people are like, "Where did you get this dress? It's this bright rainbow, crazy dress. Where did you get it?" And she's like, "I designed it with my mind." You know, it's just magical. And um, the response from people was so cool. And my boyfriend Ken, um, he's like, "You have something here. There's something here. You have yeah. to do something with this." And I was like, "No, I am not gonna sew things. You know, I'm not gonna do that. I don't want to be a seamstress. Not what I want to do. Um, I'm a tech person." <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you know, we just kind of shelved it. We actually kind of, we kind of did a little business plan around it, though. Like, what if we did? What would that look like? We could outsource the sewing if you don't want to do it. What would it look like? Didn't make sense. Um, so we just kind of shelved it. And after it kind of ruminated, I think, with Ken for a few months, he came back a couple months later and he goes, I think I've got it. He's like, what if, what if? They just wore the drawing instead of trying to recreate it. We print the drawing. We use sublimation printing, um, but we create a special pattern that looks just like a coloring sheet, something super simple that a kid can understand, and we turn that into the drawing. It's exactly what they drew. We don't modify it. We don't you know, filter it with our adult minds in yeah. any way. It's what they drew. It's pure, and um, that that is what resonated and that was like yes let's do that that i can get behind and so um and that was you know probably six months or so after she, you know she first wore that dress and um and so we invited um a friend of ours stefan to help kind of get logistics and figure out what we would need to do to get this done we called our friend iggy who um is a great designer owned his own agency in exchange for equity, as long as he could do it in his free time, you know, um, he did our website. And so we worked with Iggy, we worked with Stefan, Ken and I, and really, um, we started working on prototypes and just making it all come together. About 10 months later, we had a website that Iggy says, okay, I think it's ready to go. 
let's test it, tested it with about five people, um, got a little feedback. And, um, and then after we made those adjustments, we were just at a place where we were like, well, I guess we just need to let the world know we have it, um, that there's this thing that exists that we made. And, and it was just intended to be a proof of concept. You know, we did it again, it was, we did it in our free time. We didn't pour a lot of money into it. Um, we put some money into, you know, doing prototypes and developing a, a template. Um, we did just dresses to start. And we did just dresses because, again, proof of concept. And we learned along the way as we were doing the pattern development and stuff that T-shirts were a lot more time consuming and a lot more expensive. So we thought, let's just see if people will even do this process of going to our website, printing out a paper, going away, coloring it, and then taking a picture and coming back to the website to place an order. We didn't even know if that was logical. And, you know, like it, it made sense to us, but would people really do it? Um, and so I posted a tweet. It was the 6.22 a.m. I will never forget this because this tweet changed my life. Um, it was 6.22 a.m. It was uh, August 17th <coughs> of 2016. And I posted the, a tweet that just said, hey, check out this thing some friends and I made with a link to picturethisclothing.com. And it automatically popped in the little picture from our homepage, which is, it was uh, my daughter and her best friend holding, you know, dresses that they had drawn and they're wearing, wearing them. And um, by the end of the same day, we got a write-up in TechCrunch. And it was funny because they didn't tell us they were doing the write-up. They just, we got an email from TechCrunch, from a writer from TechCrunch, and it, it just asked a few questions. So I answered them thoughtfully, thinking maybe they'll want to do a story on us. And within like 30 minutes of me responding, we um, we noticed a lot of traffic. <laughs> and then we noticed our website crashed. And then we saw that um, we had been tagged on a, we had been somebody had written about us. So um, TechCrunch did a story and then the next day and then the next day and then it's just like one thing after another. It was yeah. TechCrunch and then Product Hunt and then Disney'sBabble.com, which is a parenting blog, um, reached out to do an interview and then um, another company reached out to do a Skype interview and they made a video and, and it was just like one thing after another and we didn't actually see sales for the first Maybe five days. So that was interesting and something not a lot of people know. Scary probably too. <laughs> It was, it was one of those things where we're like, aha, glad we didn't put a lot of money into this up front because, you know, like maybe it is a great idea and it's getting a lot of buzz, but why is nobody actually doing it? And what we learned, though, is it just it takes a minute for people to come up with their designs. But once that uh, DisneyBabble.com article went live, which was like one full week after we launched that's when we started seeing sales. And, you know, we had a few friends who were like, oh, they would placed orders for us. Super cool friends. Thank you. But, you know, it, it was one of those things where we saw, you know, maybe three or four sales a day there for the first few days. And we were like, well, cool. You know, this is something we can sustain. We all had day jobs anyway. We were all doing, you know, owning our own companies, doing our own things. Mm -hmm. um, so we were not really um, looking for a new full-time gig <laughs> per se we just thought, had this idea and we knew we had to get out into the world so we made it and we did it and and then it went viral and so um another two weeks after one of the interviews i had done they had posted their video it was the day before labor day and this is where we saw sales and it was like okay concept proven um their video went viral on facebook it got um Three million views in less than 24 hours. Three million. And I know I was like, oh my gosh. And then the next day we did $10,000 in sales in one day. And and that was just like going from zero to 100. You know, yeah. it was awesome. And we were like, oh my gosh, we haven't even shipped a single product yet. <laughs> you know, like we, we were ready. We were getting stuff going. But, you know, things had been, we had a few kinks to work out. We realized our sizing was a little bit funky. We had things to just tweak really fast. Mm -hmm. And then we started shipping. And um, man, it just never stopped after that. Like it, it just kept going and going. And we were right at the start of the holiday season too. So, you know, that viral video from there, we were invited to uh, HLN um, has a HLN was that news. It's a news channel. It, they have a show called Michaela, a morning show. They 
invited us out to LA, put us on their morning show, got to talk about it. That was super cool. Then Harry Connick Jr. has a show called Harry. They invited us, flew us out to New York, did some interviews. We got to be on Harry. And it was just like, well, you know, one was in October, one was in November. And then stuff like um, Ashton Kutcher had posted about us. He had seen it on, you know, like he retweeted, well, here's a cool idea. And then George Takei posted, wow, I wonder if I could wear this, you know, about the dress, which was super hilarious and awesome. And, um, and then more our videos started getting made and this was a funny thing too so we started really getting reamed um for only having dresses people were like oh you're sexist we we're like oh we didn't know we were gonna go viral and we didn't yeah. make these videos and the videos were awesome but um you know it really pushed the focus on the dresses and so we worked really hard to get our t-shirts out um and it was one of those things where like we were trying to man we're three people trying to manage all of these orders and all this craziness while also trying to develop a new product in parallel, that was a big challenge. And Ken really nailed that down. We couldn't have done it. You know, I, I can't imagine having tried to work through that with anybody else. But but boy, it puts a lot of stress on your uh, relationship, too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, um, I mean, that's just something, you know, your show is, is kind of, you know, we want to talk about. I, I've talked about all this amazing, incredible stuff, but there really is, there are a lot of, <laughs> difficult challenges that came out of that you know you have to learn a lot really fast we none of us have clothing background we've done e-commerce stuff from a technology side before we worked at zappos we were actually ken and i were both a part of the very first mobile apps at zappos that so we were nice. part of that team and um and it did super well it was great but you know it's like we understand these things but it was our first time actually running yeah. our own e-commerce company you know and um and the stress, like the stress that that happened with that volume, I can't even capture. I don't know how to communicate it, but like it was so stressful. Like it started taking over our house for one. So we had a local manufacturer that was 15 minutes away. And we did that because, again, proof of concept. We didn't want to yeah, yeah. invest in huge machines and stuff to get started. So we found somebody who could do print, cut and sew locally 15 minutes from our house and great job and and manage the volume. And so once we got into a groove, we were in good shape that way. But, you know, I would run down and pick up these massive boxes of like 400 items, take them back to my house, photograph every single one because it's one of a kind articles. Yeah. Um, and we had like three different systems. There wasn't one system that was really built to manage one of a kind articles. So that was a, a software learning curve there. Um, so every order that I was, pro you know, we were processing, it has the image processing side, which was all Ken, and then the packing and shipping, which was all me, and then Iggy <coughs> trying to keep everything up and running, you know, the website crashed yeah. the, that one day, and then it crashed again a few days later, and, you know, so really trying to get that stable, because we had built it, you know, just kind of, it wasn't, it's, it's a well-built website, but we used a lot of plugins and yeah. stuff to get it customized the way we wanted, and so, you know, you learn a lot um, really fast that way. But with it, you know, all these orders and things, stuff taking over our house. And I like there I had reached a point of being so stressed out. I actually told Ken at one point, I'm like, you got to move out. Like and I was serious. Like I was really we were we were like this yeah. a little bit and, you know, just so much stress and trying to solve all the problems that that cropped up. And it just seemed like every problem we would overcome, two more would crop up. It was like, you know, that whole that scenario of trying to plug holes on a leaky boat like you plug one and then four new ones spring and it was just like that for for six months like without stopping um and then it finally started to slow down and we were grateful for the slowdown you know um but i feel like i haven't let you no <laughs> no it's, it's I've, I've been taking notes to make sure I've, i got a whole bunch of there's so much uh interesting layers of this to uh to unpack like i think the uh kind of leading into it one of the things that I've noticed over the last couple of years, um, we just moved and we've been going through a bunch too. And so much of it seems like it's about making deliberate choices either to open up space or um, all of that. And in this case, those choices are kind of what led you and gave you the space to come up with this idea. Yeah. Uh, and then the going viral. Like everybody's like, that's everybody's dream, right? It's everybody's if dream. If you build it, they will come. <laughs> right. And I spend all my time telling people that doesn't happen. You know, and it, really, <laughs> it generally doesn't. 
But it usually doesn't. But I believe we had something special and we executed yeah. it well. And and that <clears> is that is a. But I think everybody thinks going viral in terms of, and and it's a good problem to have growth, sure. but there's a lot of baggage that comes with that in that you have to scale fast, quick, any problems you have are amplified. Um, the pain of dealing with those issues, like you said, plugging a leaky boat. Um, yeah. And it, it can overwhelm you. Whereas, you know, even though that's what everybody wishes for, it's be careful what you wish for. You know? Yeah. Cause it, it happens. And it's funny because, you know, with that whole, you know, the thing that led up, I had, I had reached this space when I made that dress, that very first dress for Zia, my daughter, um, you know, I had created this like really comfortable, delightful life. I was yeah. working, I had actually working remotely as a COO for a company called Martian Craft. It was a tech company. They were a coaching client and it rolled into something more. So um, like in February of, of 2016, I had accepted their offer to, to become their COO. And again, it was a remote position, but I was full time. You know, I was, I had accepted a full time job for the first time in, um, in years, in like four years, I had been doing my own independent thing and creating my time. And I created this like perfect little situation where I owned my time. I was, you know, a nice, great position at a great company I love still today. And then all of a sudden, this great idea that we made, our idea baby, comes into the world. And, and it was like a wrecking ball just knocking me right out of my game basically like off my chair through the wall like it, it and it you know I I'm not complaining it's not a complaint in any way but yeah. it's a reality of of <laughs> you know oh my gosh like you think you got a lot of plates spinning and then throw some a viral idea into the mix because a viral a viral thing comes with a lot more than just great sales you know it, it comes with 200 and I'm not exaggerating I was getting 200 emails a day for at least, I don't know, four or five weeks. And I, I, that was the first thing that we did was hire somebody to come in and help me, um, manage emails. And I needed somebody that had the right voice and that had the right care. Um, and customer service, I don't take lightly, you know, it's a very serious thing with this company and with our brand and it had to be the right person. And Amy, um, we brought in somebody we knew and had worked with before Amy came in and really helped be that voice and extend that beyond me. So I could then focus on packing and shipping. And then I was able to actually bring my sister in to help with packing and shipping and relieve some of that stress. So I could help, you know, focus on the growing and, and not, kicking the love of my life out of my out of my house <laughs> you know so um you know it, it's just it's crazy the stress that it brings and i ended up um i had to quit quit my job actually i couldn't manage two full time jobs and be a mom and yeah. you know all of these things so i had to make a choice and i chose to you know this is I think I said my idea, baby, this is the baby that I created. I'm going to go with this, ride it till the wheels fall off. And, and then, you know, and I hated to leave Martian craft. I love Martian craft and I'm still like, I have so much respect and love for those guys and or guys and women, girls, boys and girls. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, that for that team, I, I just, um, it was hard to leave, but I knew it was what I had to do. And, um, you know, but when you leave, you're leaving a reliable income. You're just, cutting that cord. So, you know, like, yes, we're making a lot of money, but you got to put a lot back into the company to make it grow. And so, you know, people like it, we did, um, people like, how much have you made? You know, we, we passed a, a million dollars in sales earlier this year. Um, so in less than two years, we did 1,045,000. Um, and we'll, we'll, we're coming up on two years here in August. So, you know, I'm excited. Sales have definitely slowed down, but like this time of year, um, we had equally slow this time last year and we still um came out awesome you know at the end of of december so while it's slow and while we're trying to figure out like now what do you do you know the viral is gone viral could not you know may yeah. not ever happen again like don't ever expect lightning to strike twice right yeah. um so you got to figure out how to leverage <coughs> that moment because if you don't it will just fizzle out and i imagine that's almost uh a challenge unto itself in that you grow so fast and then all of a sudden that <laughs> source <laughs> dries up a little bit and you have yep. to figure out, okay, how do I do this under normal circumstances yep. and operate into those um, scenarios? And that's, yeah, that's like a whole new challenge. 
you've got to kind of learn all over again. And that's like, if you know, I think something we did well and, you know, I feel good about is that we had we had money, we were making money. Um, we, we had set the company up to be profitable from sale one because we were outsourcing that manufacturing. And so, you know, people place the order, they're paying for it in full, then we pay for the work to, to be done. So we have, you know, it's basically building some capital, but then also we didn't pay ourselves until tax time. And then when we paid ourselves, because you just earned a bunch of extra money, somebody's got to pay taxes on that. Don't forget about taxes, because I think that's where a lot of people get into trouble is they they want to pay themselves. They want to reward themselves for all the hard work. And there's money in the bank account. But you got to really look at like, OK, we, we owe taxes on this and we're going to want to plan for what happens if it gets slow and you know make sure we got six months of of runway and um so we did do that we did that you know i feel like i knew enough about finances i've never had debt in my life and i don't want to start now um and so you know that was important to me and to my team to our team so yeah i i think that was a that's one of those things that i think if we had done wrong um, it could have squashed us. I think another thing that we did right, despite the angry hate mails about being sexist, if we had launched with t-shirts, I think the order volume would have killed us. I, I think it would have doubled our order volume right out of the get-go. And I think we would have squashed ourselves. And like you hear about those stories too, yeah. where it's just like you can't keep up with the demand and you run yourself out of business that way. And I think a lot of people are like, oh, they're crazy. They didn't do it right the first time. But I believe we did it right the first time. I believe launching <laughs> with one single product, nailing it, and then expanding was yeah. the right way to go. It's it's so easy to be an armchair quarterback, right? Isn't like, it? <laughs> you know, it's uh, it's almost like a, an easy, just favorite pastime for everybody to, to sit is. back and say what you should have done. Oh, and, and that's... Exactly. And that's really, you know, when I was talking about all the things that come with going going viral, there's the email volume, but there's the social media aspects and making sure that you're answering those questions that are out there and and fielding the comments, not being defensive, knowing which ones to answer, which ones to just let go of. And the ones that you answer, you answer heartfully. You don't answer them defensively or angrily um, because it represents your brand in every way, every touch point. And I I think, you know, we we took a lot of care in those actions. Um, And, you know, it's hard sometimes you you care about your your thing that you made. You love it. (laughs) So it's hurtful. But you um, you you gain a thick skin. Yeah. Yeah. You have to. You really do. Um, So we've accidentally covered <laughs> most of the things we wanted to touch on. Um, are there, so from a software operations logistics standpoint, um, are there any kind of recurring problems that you currently have or have recently had that you either neglected when you, sh- or not recurring problems necessarily, but recurring tasks and things um, where you looking at it in hindsight, you're like, man, we should have sat down a month ago and spent a week fixing that problem because now we spent so much more time just duct taping it together. Like, are there (laughs) things like that that you wish you had just invested more time in doing right Mm -hmm. up front? You know, there, there are, I guess like if you can go back, you, there are always things you would change. Right. Um, you know, I think there are things that we constantly learn along the way. Um, I think, I guess if we could go back and and do something different, we probably would have built the website a little differently. Um, We used WordPress templates and we used a lot of plugins. And when one plugin does an update, it breaks everything else. So, you know, like that was a challenge. But at the same time, we have a pretty good website. Like it's pretty solid. So at least like, you know, we did the best we could working on a pretty lean budget and, uh, and that, and that sort of thing. So, uh, you know, I feel like most of the stuff that comes up, like we did a few things the wrong way and then we went back and did it again. So I would love to remove those wrong ways um, out of all of the equations, but he can't. And, you know, we learned a lot from doing it wrong, um, a few things, but there are a lot of tasks that we have automated, um, uh, you know, and like been able to kind of operate things really leanly again. Um, But yeah, we kind of, we spent a little more trying to, fix things certain ways where I think if we had just approached it in a different way and I don't get too specific because we have a lot of trade secret stuff in our process that I can't share, but a lot of it has to do with, with that and the trade secret stuff that has been developed 
is amazing. You know, I feel like um, our team has really um, ri- risen to the occasion of when there's a problem, let's let's see what exists out in the world. Is there something that we can use and bring in or is it something we need to create from scratch? Yep. And there have been some instances where we just have to do it from scratch ourselves. And um, I don't always recommend that, but sometimes it's the well, right way to go. There's one of the things I try to talk about with people a lot is uh, automation. And yeah. everybody, you know, there's something... Everybody has processes or problems in their business they hate. It drives them nuts. And that first thought is, let's just fix this forever. As yeah. opposed to, like, here's where I'm doing everything by hand and here's perfect automation. It's yep. a spectrum. And you can yep. just inch towards that perfect automation. But if you try to jump to it, you're going to, you know, like with software, you're going to build the wrong thing. You're going to automate it incorrectly. You almost need that pain. Right. You need things to be just crummy and miserable. So you learn how to do it correctly when you do automate it. And so I think that's so on target like that. I couldn't have said that better myself. And like so it's, um, like WordPress. Yeah, that was probably a good decision. Right. That's what got you live to validate yeah. the idea. Now, you exactly. may want to circle back, but it got you here, you know, so it, you may not exactly. love it, but it worked. And there's. And I, don't hate it either. Right. You know? Exactly. So there's That's... too often we get this idea like, oh, no, this isn't good enough to launch. But the reality is you don't know it's good enough to launch until you launch. Exactly. And if the launch goes bad, you can launch again. Like, it's not fun. But the reality is you can. Um, and that's that's so true. And I think, you know, kind of going back to that, like, why did we only launch with dresses? And it was, you know, why not just add t-shirts? T-shirts were a lot more expensive and a lot more time consuming because we cut and sew everything. Collars have to be aligned and the artwork, yeah. the, the sleeves. If we were just stamping on pre-made stuff, yeah. you get missing patches where it wrinkles and folds. It's just not good quality. And we wanted the quality to be there because kids, when they design something, they care. They care right. that it looks like what they created on purpose, you know, yeah. and we care about that. We want to give them that. And, but you know, those, those things. So we started with something that we knew we could do and just test. And, you know, I think, I think if we had done it any other way, we would have regretted that. And, you know, I, I, I think starting small and starting focused is exactly the right the more focused you can be like don't we could have waited another six months until we were ready with t-shirts or we could just get the idea out and see if it was worth spending the time another six months on t-shirts and so I, i really feel like you know those are lessons that we learned through experience with our other you know jobs and other work history that we had we knew that like this is enough to get this idea out the door and just see if it works so i think that you brought up a great point with that um and i think it's important for people to see just how messy it is getting something off the ground like that like everybody you're not just going to launch and then everything's going to be perfect and you're going to cash checks you're going (laughs) to launch and everything's going to be really painful and then you're going to fix that and then something else will come up. It's and a lot of work. <laughs> it's a constant game of optimization and making decisions. And, you know, there's always something else to improve. And, always. you know, to me, being kind of messy like that um, in a good way, like not messy like bad, but like messy scrappy is the word yeah. we use a lot. Um, that uh, it, it it's just the way to do it. Um, it's uncomfortable. And I think that scares people away, but it's the way to do it. And sometimes it's not going to work, but. And and that's, you know, I think, I think you always have to have like a a reality check every once in a while. It's like, you know, sales are slow right now. If we, if we hadn't seen, so let's go back like a year, right? Last year, sales really started to plummet after the the whole viral thing went, sales just went. And while it was thing is paying for itself we weren't paying ourselves yeah. right and we thought okay well we paid ourselves enough to cover taxes so we were good <coughs> there but still not like bringing in a salary or anything we you know, like quit our jobs and stuff some of us um and in you know it's just like okay what do we do here um make sure that you know what your your lifespan is i guess if you're gonna make that commitment to jump um you know i i made that jump i'd built a pretty good safety net for myself just from my prior stuff i knew i wanted to always allow myself the freedom to say no to anything i didn't want to do so i had i'd worked really hard to build up a nice savings nest egg and yes i'm chipping away at that right now because we're not paying ourselves but um 
but I, I think that everything we're working toward in this company, I will believe in it until it gives me a reason not to believe in it. And so these slow sales that are happening right now, exact repeat of last year. And if we can at least do as well as we did last holiday, I know we're good for another year. So like, I'm just going to keep riding with that. And if I'm really smart and I whittle, you know, like just scale my needs back and to just enough, I don't need anything fancy. Um, I can ride this wave and I can ride the downs and I can be prepared for that. But the downsides happen. And I think that Sometimes when things are going really, really great, you're like, oh, yeah, we don't need PR. We don't need advertising. This thing sells itself. And, you yeah. know, it's like don't get overconfident um, because the, the the buzz will die down. And, yeah. and I think that's been one of the kind of coolest lessons for us. It's – I don't know. It's been one of the coolest lessons because we have something that people, people send us their content um, all the time, you know, and that's awesome another really cool feature of, of this thing that we have, but that's not the same for everybody in the same product and, you know, like for everybody's product. And you really have to look at what you have and understand the, I don't know, understand where it's going to go up and down and, and try to learn it and learn from it and then grow and, yeah. and keep moving. <laughs> there's, so. there's peaks and valleys. The perpetual growth thing is, is uh, Forever, not yeah. always there. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so, to wrap this up, there's one of my favorite questions, because obviously we can't go back in time. <laughs> but if you could go back in time um, to any point um, directly related to picture this or not um, and give yourself one piece of advice and know that you would actually listen. Right. So yeah. you don't have to worry about a younger you ignoring you and blowing you off saying whatever. You don't know what you're talking about. You know, you would actually listen. Um, what would you go back and tell yourself? You know, I would tell myself to put put the idea out there and I think I say that specifically to myself because I used to not blog not speak not be out there socially because I was too afraid that I didn't have anything of value to say that I didn't have anything neat or important or worth sharing and I finally got over that little bump in around 2010 and I started speaking, um, doing public speaking stuff. And once I started doing it, it's scary. It's still yeah. scary. I've been doing it for eight years now and it's still scary every time. But I do it because it challenges me to grow in a way that's scary, um, that, that, that I think helps. And so, you know, every idea, finish it. Um, don't just leave it hanging three quarters of the way. And I think, I guess that's kind of a, a big answer, but like, I guess put myself out there and then, and, and finish. Don't just start, but finish the idea, whatever it is, finish it, bring it to closure um, and get it out there. It, don't be afraid to share it. it. Maybe it is dumb. Who cares? Like at yeah. least you finished it and you put it out there. You finish it, you're going to be 80 like ahead of 80 percent of the other people out there who just have the idea and get it maybe three quarters of the way and then move on to something else well and um, the experience of launching and promoting something to me is and for probably most creators is the most uncomfortable phase where <laughs> you get the wind knocked out of you and all of a sudden you doubt you know you can be confident for a year while you create something and then it comes time to share it and you're like oh man this is crap i can't share this yeah. And it's and you lose that confidence and but on the other hand, releasing it into the real world with real feedback who aren't your parents and going to say, you know, or friends and family and say, oh, this is great. <laughs> yeah. You know, you're going to hear real things. Um, that's where you learn the lessons that you can then apply to whatever that next thing is. And it's exactly. that kind of crucible, which often isn't fun. Um, but that's what helps, uh, help you get to whatever that next thing is. If there is a next thing or helps you realize, Oh, here's where I messed up here. Um, and to me, I still hate that feeling every time <laughs> I launch, I just launched, relaunched my book and I hated that. Like I was, this, I was the most nervous I've ever been about a launch. Um, and it doesn't change, but you kind of, you learn, you're like, okay, I did that wrong. I'm gonna do it better next time. Uh, yeah. let's do it. You learn and you get better and stronger and you, can look back at all the things that you did because you have a tangible point at which it was put out there and I don't know to me it's like little footprints or whatever and yeah. I love that I love looking back and going I did a thing I did a thing I did a thing and here I am and it's leading somewhere I don't know where I don't know that this is my end point I think there's still so much more in my future you know and this is 
just a really cool thing that happened and we're going to run with it as long as we can. But yes, I think, yeah, put stuff out there. Don't be afraid. Learn from it. Grow. Keep going. Man, that confidence thing is really, uh, I get my confidence shaken every, I don't know, three months. <laughs> I'm yeah. just like, oh, yeah. It's constant. It's constant, no matter how successful you are. Yeah, it really is. And I don't know, I embrace that and I love it and it's humbling. Um, yeah, I don't, but I don't know what else I'd be doing, I guess, if not this. So yeah, you just keep finding things that I love doing and I don't know. Right on. <laughs> Well, no, we've covered a lot of ground. This is great. Um, I'm really excited about this one. I feel like it's a different angle on um, a lot of things that we don't usually get to cover. So, uh, yeah. So thanks so much for being on here. Uh, do you have any parting words, any last words of advice to somebody else who's on the fence thinking about changing? Oh, man. You know, I think um, parting words of advice. You know, I think, again, it's like it's finished the idea. Like if I had to give anybody like just – do the thing like don't whatever it is that's stopping you look at it and start chipping away at it and then keep moving forward because you will get over that obstacle eventually you just have to identify it and then chip away at it and keep moving um that's the stuff that changed my life and i had to break it down super small and um you know like one sip of water at a time i mean it was yeah. so small break it down tackle it keep moving right on cool Thanks again so much. This is great. I really <laughs> appreciate you. it. Yeah. Oh, it was a lot of fun, Garrett. Thank you. Sure thing.